turn in your Bible to John chapter 20, and we will um, read the first five verses. Um, it's been, been a while since we were here on Wednesday night. I'm not going to reteach uh, everything from John chapter 20 and start it all over again like, I, like we haven't touched it before, but I am going to just kind of touch on the highlights uh, to get us down, down the chapter a ways. And um, John was right, there are two resurrections. The first resurrection uh, is the resurrection of the saints. That, and, and somebody asked this question one time, like in the Facebook group or something like that. The, the resurrection of God's saints and the rapture are the exact same thing. They're not different, for, there's not... A rapture and then a resurrection or a resurrection and then a rapture. There's not two raptures. Don't even. Don't even. Don't let somebody. Because let me tell you. Let me tell you that the people who believe the two rapture theory. They, they have to. They have to. By nature of what it, what it means and what it represents. They have to have. A judgment from God toward his saints that is based upon their works because because some people are so hung up on once prayed always saved and then when they don't live a Christian life from that point forward there are people who have invented in their mind two raptures one is for the good Christians and the other is for the bad Christians I'm not making that up. Um, listen, they ain't, none, they ain't none of us worthy to be translated into heaven. Amen? Not a one of us. So get this idea about, well, that's the good Christians and that's the bad Christians. Listen, there's just Christians. And they're all rotten. Amen? They ain't none, they ain't none of us worthy. Uh, it's what Paul said, we were talking about it uh, Sunday night, who is sufficient for these things? Who, who can just make himself be a better Christian? None of us can. And uh, so anyway, uh, we'll, we, I won't get into that, but that's just what some people say. But there are two resurrections. The resurrection of the saints is the translation, the rapture being caught up. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul specifically aims the, the doctrine of the resurrection um, and links it with the rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. And in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So that's the first resurrection. The second resurrection it falls in line with Isaiah 66. When, when we look into the lake of fire and we see the carcasses of those who are in the lake of fire, the reason why they have a carcass is that God has resurrected them, given them an everlasting body. Why an everlasting body? Because this body would simply burn up into nothing in a matter of, probably in the lake of fire in a matter of seconds. But, and this is, uh, contemplate this for a while. Next time the devil comes after you with temptation and so on, contemplate this. Hell and the lake of fire are forever. It's torture and it's punishment never ceases, never does. And that's just another reason for you to not want to uh, give up on Christ, give up on his, his salvation. Don't walk away from it because I guarantee you when you get to see those who are in the lake of fire, You'll be glad that God kept you. Amen? You'll be glad that he did. John chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early 
Remember, she was delivered of seven devils. She came early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is that? It's John Cooley. It's John, the disciple, the apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. So there for a while, they did not understand nor believe the resurrection had taken place. Christ's resurrection. They were still doubting in their mind even and we'll get into it even though christ had told them several times this is what's going to happen uh the only thing that they could come up with was somebody's taking his his body and taking it and laid it somewhere else I, we don't know who it was um verse three peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher so they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun peter but that made peter feel good Peter's about halfway there going, <gasps> should he give up smoking a long time ago? And um, Peter therefore went forth and another disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and, and ask God's blessing on tonight as we study his word and upon uh, those, who, uh, those who need some God to touch them tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, gathering us into your house tonight. We thank you, God, for uh, these families and these people, Lord, that, that are all together. We thank you, Lord, for the families that we have online, Lord, that we're all together in one place. And Lord, you, you told us, you promised us, where two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And behold, Jesus, we thank you for being in the midst of all of us. Lord, as we worship you, as we sing praises to your name, as we, um, as we study your word and learn from it, I pray, dear God, that you would increase our faith Lord, if, if Jesus can be resurrected, God, if you can resurrect Christ, then you can resurrect any one of us, and we believe that. We know it's going to happen. It's as, just as sure as my first birth took place, my second birth is already written down. And Father, I thank you for that. And Lord, just guide us gently as we go through your word and teach us Father, even though we may have read this before, some may have studied it this week, but Father, tonight, teach us all something, Lord, that uh, maybe we never considered before, and open our eyes. We ask your blessings upon your word in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. So they ran both together, and that other disciple, verse 4 again, did outrun Peter. And... Um, Maybe it wasn't a, an issue of Peter's health or John's health. Maybe it was just John that was a little bit more excited about it. Because remember, Peter at this time, from the, from the time Christ died uh, until the time Christ is walking on the water toward the boat and he calls Peter out to come to him, uh, Peter made this statement, I'm going fishing. And I always looked at that, and that's in our text. I always looked at that as like, Peter's like, forget this. I can't, t I can't take any more of this. I mean, I, I love God. I love Jesus. But now he's gone. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going to happen. And so the tendency to return back to the life previous lived happens probably in all of us at some point in our walk with the Lord. We all kind of just drop everything and say, I'm going fishing. And I'm, I'm not, I'm just, that's it, I'm done. 
Uh, I still love the Lord, but I just can't, I can't take this anymore. And uh, so that's, that's what he does. And, and for some reason, and I don't know exactly why, I don't know if this was a, just a common thing that uh, workers, those, those men who worked an outside job, um, but later on we'll find out that Peter is undressed in that boat. And um, it's amazing to me that when Jesus calls him, the first thing Peter wants to do is get dressed. All right. So anyway, now verse six, then come Simon with Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see if the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Uh, then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believed for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. And again, I think I made a point of this uh, in teaching it earlier. Uh, when it says they knew not the scriptures. I, there's no doubt that in fact, there's absolutely zero doubt that Jesus told them in no uncertain terms, this is what's going to happen. But when the Bible says they knew not the scriptures, I think that means that they, they knew it not in a way that they understood because Jesus said, Matthew 17, 22, Jesus said unto them, the son of man shall be betrayed into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Now they were sorry about the fact that he was going to be killed. But when Jesus said he shall be raised again, that did not register with them. Even though Jesus told them, don't worry about it. I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back to life. Uh, any normal person um, I, and I absolutely believe the Holy Spirit withheld this knowing, this knowledge from those disciples and those who knew Christ and followed Christ simply because if you, if you look at the life of Christ while he's on this earth, he is constantly downplaying his role. He does not want people to put him on a on a throne somewhere, carry him about on their shoulders and say, here's our Messiah. Here's the King of Kings. He's going to destroy the Roman Empire for us. And he's going to exalt Israel above all men. And that's not what Jesus came for. It's not what he was coming for. He came to die for them. He came to, to pay the penalty for their sins so their sins could be forgiven. That's what he came to do. And, he, and Jesus, knowing that, is not going to allow himself to be exalted the way man wants to exalt him. He's just not going to do it. So anyway, Hosea chapter 6, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. So there, here's, a, here's another prophecy that I'm sure Peter and John and those other men having been familiar with the Old Testament text, being lifelong Jews, they would have heard this read in the synagogue. They may have heard uh, a few lectures or sermons or whatever it was that they did in the synagogue. I'm sure they heard things about it. But it, again, it just doesn't register that Jesus said, on the third day, he shall be raised again. And then here's Hosea saying, in the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. And so it, it's just not, they heard it, they have it, but they don't understand it. They can't see it for what it is. And that, my friends, whenever you uh, decide one day that you're going to devote yourself to study Bible prophecy, I want to warn you against it. Because you're going to start looking for things that God's not going to show you. It happened to me. It happens to me. 
And uh, there are things that God, certainly there's nothing wrong with studying prophecy. There's nothing wrong with uh, enjoying the study of not only prophecies that have already been fulfilled, but, you know, making, a, making your own private list of prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. And understanding that around the days of Christ's second coming, those things are going to be fulfilled. They're going to be done. Uh, but prophecy is always best understood after its fulfillment. Always. I mean, they have the prophecy in Joel about whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. No one's really talking about that until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell upon all those men and Peter rose up and he preaches that first message and he's preaching scripture and he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now he understands it. Now he gets it because he, he sees it happening right in front of his very eyes. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And lo and behold, after he preached that message, there's 3,000 men going, what must we do to be saved? Call on the name of the Lord. I just said it. Call on the name of the Lord. So they did, and they were saved that day. Um, and let's see here, Matthew 20. Jesus going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed I mean, here he is literally days before he's to be crucified. The Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge, and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. What's interesting to me is, is that Christ in... Um, predicting what is going to happen or prophesying what is going to happen, he brings in things that probably the Jews would have never thought of. The Son of Man's going to be turned over to the Gentiles. And I can, I can just see Peter and all those Jews going, Oh, surely not. Oh, God forbid it to be so. Well, no, I am. I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles. Peter... You see them, you ever seen them Romans scourge somebody? Yeah, they're going to do that to me. Oh, Lord, forbid it to be so. Oh, we, no, no, you can't be that. You're the son of God. No, and they're going to crucify me too. And I'm going to die, Peter. And the third day, I'll rise again. Oh, Lord, no, you can't die. He, it, that whole resurrection thing did not register with him or the other disciples at all all they heard and listen to this, this is a good lesson all they heard was he's going to die how many times have we approached a difficult situation and said oh this is the end i mean this there's just no way out of this 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 is all Everything's going to fall apart. Everything's going to collapse. Everything, I'm going to lose everything. Um, th that's it. That's, that's just it. Uh, I don't know if Randy Casey ever told you uh, his testimony. But I just love that man. I would see him around town. Randy Casey, to me, he was one of my teachers at Twin City Christian Academy. And um, I... I have a bad habit of mimicking, well, I did back then especially, of mimicking preachers. And so there was things about Randy that I liked and I would mimic him in, in my early days preaching and so on. And I would see Randy at Walmart and I saw him one time and I knew that he had uh, prostate cancer. And I went and hugged his neck and I said, Randy, I'll just let you know I'm praying for you, I love you. And of course he had just a smile on his face. And uh, he said, God's got it. And uh, it had uh, metastasized and it had spread. And what the last thing I had heard was that he's, he's going to die from it. It's going to kill him. This is years ago. A year later, 
I, I mean, I didn't hear nothing about it. A year later, I see him at Walmart again. Randy, how you doing? Hugged his neck. He hugged mine. And uh, he said, I guess everybody gave up on me too soon. He said, I guess God said you're not ready to go. He said, so I'm here. And um, yeah, typical Randy Casey fashion. And um, all I focused on was the man that I had admired as a 13-year-old boy. Uh, a man that I had held up as a model for me to try to follow in his steps as a, as a preacher. And um, all I could see was him dying. I never saw God healing him and he not die. Never saw that. But that's exactly what happened. And I've done that in other situations too. And uh, I'm probably about as bad or worse than anybody else is of writing something off and say that's got to be the end right there. I mean, that's just my nature. Uh, but anyway, yes, sir. I'm just thinking, uh, you know, for all of Peter's, you know, when Jesus asked him, you know, who am I? And he said, you are the you know, yeah. son of God. For all the, all the knowledge that Peter had, the last thing he really did as far as interacting with Jesus was to deny him three times. And that could have had a lot of bearing on, you know, how I go fishing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are you guys listening back there? Are you listening well? Okay. All right. So all these prophecies. Look at here. Luke 13. Go ye and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. Look at that. Third day I shall be perfected. And he was. Amen. Psalms, oh, I love Psalm 16. A prophecy, for thou will not leave my soul in hell. Did, it, did he really go to hell? Yes. He went down there not to do what Kenneth Copeland and these others say. They, they say that Jesus went down there to suffer for three days in hell. And thus... <sighs> Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That nails it right there. Amen. And God did not leave Jesus there. He brought him back out. Amen. Amen. Uh, verse 11 of John chapter 20. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Mary Magdalene didn't get it. She didn't quite understand that on the third day he was going to rise again. So when she goes and sees that the body is gone, and there's two angels sitting there next to the the, uh, the linen cloth and everything like that, uh, she should have went, oh, wait a minute. Is it real? Did he rise from the... Nothing like that. And I, and I think, I think that Jesus deliberately has covered their mind's eye and covered their heart from this until... They can hear it directly from Jesus. Because he says to her, I am he. And then, boom! She's like, oh, you are! And then, I mean, what? can you imagine just the, the, the joy 
and the praise now that she has for Christ. Uh, I, I've mentioned this uh, in teaching in Sunday school about the sealed book. And this is one of those things where um, Christ has already said that, it, you know, they're going to crucify me and they're going to scourge me. And then on the third day, I'm going to rise again from the dead. Even though he said that, the book is sealed. It's closed and it's sealed and no man can understand it. And yet here's Jesus standing there. And when Mary Magdalene comes along and she sees the tomb empty except for the angels. And then she turns around and sees the gardener standing there. But she doesn't know that it's Jesus. Jesus just kind of peels off a, a seal and lets her look at something. And now she gets it. Now she understands this is Christ. This is he. He has risen from the dead. And I want you to understand there, this doctrine is what separates our faith literally from every other religion in the entire world. There is no other religion that allows for the resurrection of the dead. None. There is uh, the Hindu religions and the Hindu based religions, or shall I say the uh, reincarnation um, based religions that you die and then how you lived during that previous life will determine how you will live. Uh, but you're still living on earth. And you may have lived a junky life, uh, you know, this time around. Well, when karma kicks in, then you're going to be reincarnated, not resurrected. It's different. Because with resurrection comes a new body that has no desire to sin whatsoever. Has no sin, no death, no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, no sweat. Hey, Amen. None of that stuff. But in, in the karma-based religions, you may have to sweat and toil twice as bad in the next life than you did the previous life because you didn't do so well. Uh, it, is, it is a true fact. That before the British Empire went and made India a colony of the British Empire, there was almost no hospitals, um, hunger relief programs, Ministry to the poor. None of that. None of that. Because the Hindu religion said, if that person is dirt poor and their body is racked with disease and pain and suffering, it's their fault. And we cannot interfere with karma and reincarnation. So we can't build a hospital for them to get well in. We can't have doctors that are in villages that are operating nearly for free. We can't have giveaways of food and clothing to people that need it. We can't do it. In fact, I can't even let my son even think about marrying your daughter because you people are the slum, slum dogs of the world. And I'm not about to give my son who is elevated with us because he's lived a pure life in the previous life to defile himself with somebody who's in a lower position. And it took the British Empire going into India 
and seeing that need, they're the ones who started building the hospitals and the schools and everything else for the poor. Because the Hindu karma teachings would not allow for it. Isn't that something? Your religion says that all of you people have to suffer through this entire life and there, we cannot and will not interfere with that because you're not as good as we are. We are better than you and in the next life we will continue to be better than you. That's how they, that's how they see it to this day. That's what Hindu does. Okay? It's sad. It's sick. Um, verse 19, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut. I like this one. Jesus walks through walls. Amen? This, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst. How did he get in there? He just walked through the wall. Or he just appeared. He just showed up. Okay? That's God. Amen? That's God. Um, he came and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had uh, said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now several things here. I uh, don't have time to get into them all, but let's do this. I like, I like this. Jesus breathed on them. 1 Corinthians 15 is one of the teachings about the resurrection and, and what it's going to be like and, and how God uh, shows us in picture form what the resurrection is. In verse 44, 1 Corinthians 15, it is sown a natural body. But it has raised a spiritual body. Now something to underline, memorize, think on these things. Spirits have bodies. They are not like our bodies. But they have a body just the same. When Jesus was able to appear and disappear at will as he showed up to the disciples and so on. Uh, you remember, he says, see my hands, see my feet, see the wound in my side. He left. Thomas then shows up. Thomas didn't get to see all that. Thomas says, and I have this in my notes for later, but Thomas said, I don't believe it. Except I see, except I put my finger in that hole and put my hand in that wound. I won't believe it. So when Jesus finally appeared again, he said, here you go, Thomas. Put your finger in there. Put your hand in here. And, and Jesus was not Casper the Friendly Ghost. Okay, he had a substance about him that was tangible touchable first first john chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that that which we have handled of the word of life and of course when thomas saw that he didn't he didn't need to okay he said uh, uh yeah you're 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 god you oh, oh my lord and my god that's what he said and um but anyway spirits do have bodies it has raised a spiritual body there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. They are different from one another, but still the spiritual body is tangible. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, 
was made a living soul. And that's because God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And now Adam is made a living soul. And mankind, all of mankind, we inherited the soul from Adam. It was passed down from Adam to Seth, uh, to Noah, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Judah, uh, so on and so on. It was all passed down. Uh, my personal belief is that the human soul um, and our spirit are linked with our DNA. Is what I believe. Because remember, this book is DNA. It's the DNA of our church. It's the DNA of my new body. And so... Um, I, that's that's just kind of what I what I believe is that the soul and the spirit of man is contained in his DNA in his book of life, and that's why if you alter that book, uh, it's a no no. Okay, um, God's pretty rough when it comes to playing games. You only get one strike in God's baseball. Okay, you miss once. That's it. Okay. Anyway, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The word quicken means to be made alive again. Was made a quickening spirit. And that's what Jesus was displaying here. He, he, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. What he's doing is that he is giving them their new life now. Their new calling, their, everything that... Yeah, is about these disciples is now brand new because of, of Jesus breathing on them and he is a quickening spirit that brings them to life again. Uh, Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. 2 Timothy three sixteen. all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word means God breathed. Okay, the phrase inspiration of God is, comes from one Greek word, theopneustos, um, or yeah, something like that, theopneustos. The word theos means God, and neustos is like where we get pneumonia. Okay, it's a, it's a disease of the lungs, it's, a, it's, a, it's like with your breath. So all scripture is, is given by God's own breath. He breathed um, out of his mouth the words that he spoke. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Uh, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So just as, just as the Bible not only is inspired, inspired, but it gives inspiration. It gives inspiration to you and I when we read it, when we study it, when we think on it, when we meditate on it, when we talk about it with other people. Um, that book gives us breath, gives our soul breath, our spirit breath. And that's how we are uh, going to live again. Uh, Job 12, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Whose hand? It's in the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord hath wrought this. And in his hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. And I, again, I think that's attached to his word. Uh, the menorah, shaped like an almond tree. Well, we know that uh, what I'm showing you here on, the, on your right 
um, is the, your trachea and the bronchial tubes that go into your right and your left lung that, that bring air in and out of your body. Well, that's the seven spirits of God. That's what gives us life and light. Uh, now, I don't have time to get into this part here, uh, so we'll leave off here. But basically, um, and you know what I might do is um, make a note here. I might show you how Catholics use uh, that passage there where Jesus said that you shall be able to remit sins, you shall be able to forgive sins and so on. Uh, I'm going to show you that they say that and that's exactly what they believe. They believe that Christ has given, not to every man, just to the priests, the ability to forgive sins. So that's, that's pretty good. What if the priest that you confess to has way more sins than you do? How can he forgive your sins when he himself is double the sinner? Can't. Can't. And, uh, but you've got a billion and a half people in this world who have been taught that and they believe it. They believe it. Chris, Chris saw it. Uh, when every time I'd bring up the Catholic Church, what would them guys do? They laugh. They giggle. And I'm like, why are they laughing? Maybe they, maybe they just like, you know, have put up with that all their life and they just think it's a bunch of nonsense and so on and so on. But listen, and I'll, I'll say this, the Catholic Church is without a doubt, in my mind, the largest organized crime syndicate in the world. There was a family that several years ago, they came here for a few years and they moved away. When they first started coming here, they sent me a letter and they said, we kind of feel like you need to get to know us a little bit. So they sent me this letter kind of explaining their family. The wife had a brother the brother was married to a woman, and this woman was having an affair with a priest in St. Louis on the hill. Okay? You know what the hill is, right? It's Italians, Italian neighborhood. And it's funny because if you've got a house for sale in, on the hill... You don't sell it to somebody that's not Italian. You sell it to an Italian. I mean, they keep, they're close-knit there. But she was having this ongoing fair with this Catholic priest uh, up there. And this Catholic priest was involved in the organized crime syndicate that exists upon the hill. Okay, and what, I don't know exactly what all he did, but I know what other priests have done in Kenya is that a member of parliament will get maybe a bill passed for they're going to they're gonna allocate, I don't know, $3 million to build a, uh, an orphanage in a certain uh, diocese. And um, the money gets released. The church gets the money. But that money then is laundered. 
And the church then kicks back a large portion of that money to the member of parliament that got the money, got the bill passed. He keeps the money, but so does the priest. He keeps a portion of it too. Okay? That's, that's just corrupt. And what happened to the orphanage? Nobody knows. And because it's so rampant there, I mean, this is how that, that gas place blew up, Chris. Okay? Bribes being given to inspectors. Bribes given to officials whose job it was to make sure this place remained shut down. They were operating completely illegally. And all they had to do was bribe their way to stay in business. Shakedown. Okay? It's a shakedown. Um, but priests don't like to have blood on their robes, so they don't do the killing. They have people that work for them that will do that. Okay? And I'm just, I'm telling you, it's corrupt. Biggest organized crime syndicate in the world. Okay?